Good morning. Thank you for tuning in to Facebook Live to hear my family story. My name is Doris Lazarus, and I am the proud daughter of two Holocaust survivors. I'm always so grateful when I'm given the opportunity to fulfill my legacy of Holocaust remembrance. To remember is a sacred obligation. The story you will hear is a story about love, loss, hope, and redemption. It's a sad story, but it has a happy ending. After hearing it, I hope you will all join me in becoming keepers of the memories. As far back as I can remember, I thought that everyone's mother and father had large blue numbers on their arm, that parents always screamed during the night, and that children had no grandparents. But then I learned I was the daughter of two Holocaust survivors, born in the shadow of the Holocaust. This family history has always had a profound effect on my life. Our home was like a book with the chapter always open to the Holocaust. This painful history is in my heart and it inspires me to share my parents' story. My parents' survival meant life for me, a life of being loved and cherished and cared for. I have never known hunger or cold or fear. I was truly their reason for living. And they told me that every single day. They poured all of their dreams into me, wanting me to have the life that they never had. Today, we will remember my Bubbies, my Zadies, my grandparents, my little siblings, and all of the countless family members I never knew. They were among the six million innocents that were murdered. The number six million is staggering. So I ask you please to think of six million ones, each one a universe, just like us, with hopes and goals and dreams. My mother, Leah, was born in Chohanov, Poland in 1922, the only daughter of two loving parents, Mendel and Esther Kirschenbaum. She had three brothers, Harry, Shmuel, and Shia. They were raised in a religious household. She led a very normal, typical life. She attended school, enjoyed socializing with friends, and belonged to Hashomer Hatzair, the Zionist youth group, which instilled in her a lifelong love of Eretz Yisrael, Israel, along with the courage, bravery, and leadership skills she would later need to survive in the death camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau. She learned how to sew at a young age, becoming an apprentice at age 12. If her life had not been interrupted by the war, she probably would have married raised a family and stayed in Poland. I wish I knew more details about her life before everything changed. Although she has told me so much about her six years of captivity by the Nazis, she rarely talked about her family life before the war. I've been told that the trauma of the separation and loss of her family must have been even more painful than the horrors of the ghetto and the death camps. And so the early memories remain within her. Life in my mother's shtetl, small town, was difficult, but simple, peaceful. Although anti-Semitism did exist in Poland as she was growing up, no one could have envisioned the horrors that awaited them. In 1933, Hitler came to power in Germany and began spreading his anti-Semitic hatred throughout the country. He used propaganda to spread vicious lies and rumors about the Jewish people. It was these words that enabled Hitler to carry out the murder and the robbery of the Jewish people in Europe. Words are so powerful. Words can cause fear. Fear can cause hate. And hate can cause ordinary citizens to become willing executioners. In 1939, my mother was just 17 when Hitler's armies invaded Poland. 
Her life, her family, and her world was changed forever. First, her civil rights were taken away, and then her human rights. Jewish people had to wear a star, one in the front and one in the back. They all now became targets for public humiliation. Being caught without the star was punishable by death. Jewish people could no longer walk in the street, only in the gutters, and never more than two together. When a Nazi approached, you had to drop to your knees and he would say, good morning, swine. They couldn't own a radio, they had curfews. They could no longer enjoy the parks, sit on a bench, use public transportation, be included in sports activities, or attend school. Her father's business, their home, their money, and all personal possessions were stolen by the Nazis. They lived in fear of the future and prayed to see better days. My mother's oldest brother, Harry, escaped to Russia where he survived the Holocaust in the Soviet Gulag. Although many men of the town were arrested or simply disappeared, no one believed that the Nazis would ever harm the women and the children. And although my mother could have escaped, she chose to stay with her family, promising her mother they would always remain together. Her bond with her mother was so loving, so strong, she never imagined she could or would have to exist without her. This was the beginning of the Nazis plan to isolate and eventually murder all of the Jewish people in Europe. The Nazis were able to accomplish this with the cooperation and collaboration of many of the Polish people in her town. Yes, there were righteous individuals who did risk their life to save and help Jewish people, but this was less than 1% of the population. Neighbors, co-workers, and childhood friends all turned against the Jewish people in Chakanov. One night while asleep in their home, the Nazis came for them. They broke in, terrorizing her family, beating them, giving them just moments to pack up a lifetime. They grabbed what they could carry, a blanket, some clothes, a pot or a pan. My mother, her parents, her siblings, and all the other Jewish family in her town were forced from their home that night. They were taken to the medieval castle in the center of the town. This castle had been used for centuries for festivals and various events. They were all forced onto the trucks, the young, the old, the children, while being viciously beaten by the Nazi guards. My mother tells me how they beat her mother in the head because she just couldn't run fast enough and how they, she remembers that she had to remain silent and keep running. If she stopped to help, they both would have been shot. My mother remembers the river of red blood that flowed that night and could only ask why, but there was no why in the Holocaust. They were taken to a ghetto in the town of Neustadt. When they arrived, they were told by the Nazis that they had a few minutes to find a place to live. Anyone left on the streets would be shot. My mother banged on doors begging to be let in, but there was already unbearable overcrowding in every single apartment. Desperate to get off the streets, they ran into a horse stable. This became their home for the next one and a half years, living and sleeping on the hay like animals. Their daily life became a struggle for food, warmth, and an effort to stay clean and healthy. It was nearly impossible to wash or change their clothing, and they were quickly covered in lice. My mother became ill with typhus, which is carried by lice. She was deprived of any medical attention. She suffered and almost died. Her uncle Aaron was also ill and desperate for medical help. He removed his yellow star and escaped from the ghetto in the middle of the night. He returned to their hometown. His daughter Rivka and brother Benjamin were still hiding in the city. Someone witnessed their reunion and reported them to the Gestapo. They were interrogated and tortured. The Gestapo had a doctor examine them to see if they were fit for slave labor. 
the doctor's findings did clear them for deportation to a concentration camp. But the Gestapo decided to escalate their punishment. So by order of Adolf Eichmann, whose name appeared on the bottom of the document, and I quote, the Jews, Aaron, Rivka, Benjamin, and four others in front of their people are to be hanged until dead. Their execution took place on April 27, 1942. Rivka was 22. In spite of the Nazis' plan to kill all the Jewish people, life somehow went on in the horror of the ghetto. These brave people set up schools and secretly continued to study Torah to keep Judaism alive. The Jewish committee from her town started a soup kitchen, and it was this watery broth all that they had to eat in a day that kept them alive. Resistance also took place in the ghetto. There were so many stories of bravery and heroism, more than I could possibly tell you. The Jewish people did fight back without resources, without hope, starving, dying, they resisted. Resistance came in many different forms. Some kept secret journals or diaries. Some resisted by trying to live one more day in this hell. Some by holding on to their dignity, their humanity. So to quote Elie Wiesel, the question should be not why all the Jews did not fight back, but how so many of them did. In November of 1942, the Nazis began to evacuate the entire ghetto. My mother and the others were deceived and lied to. They were told that they were being deported to the East for work, that families would stay together. They were told to pack a small bag, take what they could carry with them, even to bring valuables if they still had any, that they would need them where they were going. My mother, her parents, and little brother were relieved to finally be leaving the ghetto. They could not imagine that anything could be worse, but then they were forced into the boxcars. Boxcars that were never meant to carry human beings. More than 100 people sealed into each boxcar. They were forced to stand, packed tightly together. There was not a wasted inch of space. The boxcar was freezing. It was pitch dark. There was no water, no food, and no toilets. Many stood in their own waste for four days and four nights. What else could they do? There was no air. It was suffocating and hard to breathe. Panic and claustrophobia set in immediately. Dehydration quickly followed, thirst even more tormenting than hunger. Mothers let the children lick the sweat from their bodies to hydrate them. They were fighting so hard for their lives. People panicked and fainted. Some died standing up, not even allowed the dignity to lie down to die. Some were silent, conserving their saliva. The rest prayed. My heart breaks for my grandmother, my grandfather, and my little uncle Shia, who never could have understood that this boxcar is where they were spending the last day of their life. The train arrived in Auschwitz-Birkenau, the infamous death camp. Starved, disoriented, and terrified, my mother and her family were met by the Gestapos with their dogs and their whips. There was screaming and gunshots and panic. It was dark and families were quickly torn apart. Within minutes, everyone my mother loved was gone and she was alone, an orphan and a slave. Nine out of every 10 people who arrived on these transports never even entered the camp. They were murdered in the gas chamber upon arrival. My mother said grieving was a luxury she could not afford. She immediately had to start fighting for her life. Every minute, every day, she was confronted with impossible dilemmas and obstacles, never knowing which choice would save her life. She was taken to a barracks. Her clothes and shoes were taken from her. Every young, religious, modest woman with her suffered through a body and cavity search. The humiliation, 
far greater than the pain. Then they shaved her head, robbing her of her femininity. Her name was taken to five harsh blue numbers were tattooed on her left arm. She was given a filthy rough striped prisoner dress to wear and mismatched wooden shoes that would cause blisters, pain and infection, but would become one of her most important possessions. Without shoes, you could not live. She was given a small metal bowl to be used both for her food and toileting needs with no opportunity to clean it in between, all part of the dehumanization process. By the time all of the new arrivals had been processed, they were unrecognizable even to each other. My mother was assigned a bunk in a barracks originally built to hold horses. This filthy, unheated wooden structure held 1,000 women. Wooden bunks lined the walls, one stacked on top of the other, each one filled with 10 women per narrow bunk. No, pills, mattri no pillows, mattresses, sheets, or blankets. The bunks were infested with rodents and lice, and sleep was impossible. There was appalling overcrowding and a chronic lack of water and latrines. In shock and exhausted, my mother prepared for her first night in Auschwitz. She was 19 years old. The women who had been there for some time told her, be strong, you are in a very bad place. They are killing people here. This is the end of the world. Forget about your home. In this place, you will be frozen and beaten and starved. This is a place to die, not to live. My mother tried not to believe what she was hearing from the others about the thick black smoke billowing from the chimney stacks. She tried to block out what they were telling her that the horrible smelling smoke from the chimney stacks was her family, that the ashes falling around her were part of them. This the human mind could not grasp. My mother was trapped in a world she never could have imagined. One thing she knew for sure, every day would be worse than the one before. The camp was a closed world where inhumanity was routine, sadism and torture, the norm. The inmates were quickly reduced to filthy, diseased, broken remnants of who they had been. Their death from hunger and sickness were all part of the system. Destruction by punishing, backbreaking, brutal work would serve the ultimate goal of murder as effectively as killing. Every morning between 3.30 and 4 a.m., she and the others were forced outside to line up for selection. They stood and shivered in the dark, in the bitter cold for hours to be counted. Forced to undress, they passed the one who with a wave of his hand decided if they were fit for one more day of life. Soon after her arrival, it was Dr. Mengele who oversaw these selections. If one looked sick or weak, had any sores or swelling in their limbs, they were sent into the line for the gas chambers. Many times, even those who were fit, who managed to stay strong, were randomly selected and sentenced to death. Once you survived one selection, you lived in fear of future selections. To fall during roll call meant death. The clothes would freeze on your back and hypothermia, frostbite and gangrene would set in. Resistance took place even during these terrifying selections. My mother would tell me how just before selection, she would eat snow or grass so that she would bloat and appear to have a big stomach. She needed to hide how emaciated she really was. Other times she would bite her finger till she drew blood, rubbing it on her cheeks to hide the pale color of starvation. I'm not sure I'll ever understand how she endured so much yet fought so hard for one more day of life. She tells me that even in the most desperate of situations, the will to live is very powerful. And although she lost everyone and everything in Auschwitz, she never lost herself. She lived with dignity, always helping others, sharing her bread, 
although she herself was starving. After the brutal selection process, she was marched out to perform slave labor. There was never a purpose to this work. It was just another torturous plan devised by the Nazis to work the Jewish people to death. My mother was forced to walk miles to work in hip high snow in the 20 below zero Polish winters. She had no boots, no coat, no socks, hat, or gloves. She worked from morning till night, beaten and humiliated by the Nazis as she broke heavy stones with a pickaxe. Her job was to move them from one side of the road to the other. It was backbreaking and almost unendurable. She was weak and undernourished and the rocks weighed so much. If she paused in her work or even straightened her back, she was viciously beaten. One beating was so brutal, it caused permanent deafness in her ear. She had to continue working as the blood flowed from the wound in her head. She was barely conscious. It was so cold, her hands froze on the shovel and wheelbarrow, her skin turning purple from the freezing conditions. At the end of the workday, she was forced to carry back the dead bodies of those who died, who were unable to survive the inhumane work conditions. By the time she got back to the barracks, she could barely crawl. Upon arriving back at the camp, the endless counting began again. The Nazis were, the Nazis were very methodical and everyone had to be accounted for, even the dead. I have asked my mother how she survived over two years in the death camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau when staying alive for 24 hours was almost impossible. She said a lot of it was luck. Once the trains did not arrive, the Nazis had a quota to meet. They selected 1,000 women for the gas chamber from her barracks. They started counting. And when they reached 1,000, the cutoff was right next to her and she was spared. Another time, the Nazis ordered everyone out of her barracks in the middle of the night, all marked for death. My mother spotted a broom outside the barracks. She slipped out of line and just started sweeping. The Nazis thought she was left there to clean the barracks. And again, her life was spared. I've asked my mother if she ever cried in Auschwitz, cried for her family, cried for the silence of the world. And she said, if you cried, you died. If you showed weakness, you didn't survive the day. I believe my mother survived because she never gave up hope. She never stopped dreaming of freedom. She said even if she was imprisoned until the end of the war and barely alive, she would have crawled out through the fence just to die free. In January 1945, the Russian army was advancing. The Nazis did not want any prisoners left behind. No eyewitnesses to tell the world about their atrocities, their crimes against humanity. Because they didn't have time to kill the remaining Jews in Auschwitz, my mother, along with 60,000 other inmates, were forced onto the death march. They were all walking skeletons and soon many became corpses. The Nazis forced them to run through snow and ice. The temperature was between 20 and 33 degrees below zero, the coldest winter ever recorded in Poland. They were given no food, no water. They were frozen, starving, and exhausted. They were brutally mistreated, whipped by the guards and attacked by dogs. There was no time to rest or pause. Those who fell behind were shot. So many died from exhaustion and exposure. At times when the guards needed to stop, they all dropped onto the snow. The women covering themselves with dead bodies to keep from freezing to death. My mother fought so hard for her life on the death march, swollen from hunger and frostbite, yet coaxing and dragging those too weak to walk, to take just one more step. After weeks of running, my mother was put in an open box car exposed to the elements. The train arrived in Robinsbrook, the women's experiment camp. There was death all around, decomposing bodies, 
women in the final stages of starvation, too weak to even move. From there, my mother was forced to march to yet another camp in Neustadt. Her legs were so frozen and swollen, she could barely walk. One morning, somewhere near the German border, the guards disappeared and she was free. This was her liberation, the moment she had dreamed of. It should have been a joyous moment, but she was numb with the realization of all she had lost. She was totally alone in the world. Where could she go? She believed that all of her family and friends were dead. Her community no longer existed. In the slim hope that anyone who might have survived would return home, she attempted to go back, but it wasn't safe. Although the Nazis stopped murdering the Jewish people at the end of the war, Poland was still anti-Semitic. Many Jewish people who survived six years of the Holocaust and made it back to their homes were murdered by their former neighbors. Many Poles had taken over Jewish homes, properties, and businesses. They did not want to see the Jewish people coming back. The Holocaust was not only the greatest murder in history, it was also the greatest robbery. My mother feared for her life after the Holocaust as much as she did while in Auschwitz. She knew she had to get out of Europe. Nothing had changed. In spite of the post-war chaos, she continued to search for her brother, Harry. She found him in Bialystok six years later after he had left home for Russia. They did not recognize each other. She made her way to Austria to a displaced persons camp in Badischl, Austria. It was called the Golden Cross. This is where she met my father, Oscar Mozak. His young wife, Perla, four-year-old son, Hirsch, and six-year-old daughter, Miriam, were all murdered when they had arrived in Auschwitz. My heart breaks as I think of them huddled in the gas chamber, so young they barely knew freedom, the horror they must have seen as they left this world. Growing up, I never knew that I was really my father's second family. He kept this secret to, scare, to spare me the pain. Secrets and silence were not uncommon in survivor homes. My father's experiences during the war were very similar to my mother's. He was one of eight brothers born in Points, Poland, the same city as Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion. He and only one brother survived two and a half years in Auschwitz-Birkenau, followed by the infamous death march, the hell of Mauthausen, and finally the frozen underground death caves of Ebensee in Austria, considered to be one of the most diabolical and horrific death, death camps. It was here that he was liberated by the American army, weighing 63 pounds. The end of the war, while ending years of agony and deprivation, found my father barely alive and struggling to regain his health. He was completely broken. My mother and father knew each other for just two weeks in the DP camp when he proposed, I'm alone, you're alone, do you wanna be alone together? Was a common proposal at the time. He had papers to come to America he was my mom's ticket out, so she agreed to marry him. It took another three years before the United States would allow them to emigrate. They had to climb the Austrian mountains into the free zone of Germany. As you can see in the photos, my father could never part with the striped prison jacket he was forced to wear in Auschwitz. In 1948, they came to Chicago to rebuild and reconstruct the lives they had lost. My mother was driven to work hard, learn the language and move forward. It wasn't easy, no one helped her. Yes, she survived, was liberated, but neither she nor many other survivors could ever be liberated from their memories. Every morning when I would call her, over 70 years later, I would say, good morning, mom, how did you sleep? 
And she would say, I wake up in Skokie, but I sleep in Auschwitz. The nightmares continue, the screams and cries during the night. Upon awakening, she can't believe she is not cold or hungry or hunted. She never looked back to the time her life was interrupted, never thought about who she could have been, was never bitter. She chose to be better. She wanted to move on to live. She lived her life with dignity and purpose. Every minute of her life was a teaching moment for others. She knew how to sew, so she put a sign in the window and started a business. She swore she would never be cold or hungry or homeless again. After a full day of cooking, cleaning, and caring for a sick husband and two daughters, she would begin to sew, spending most of the night at her sewing machine. I always believed those stitches took her far away from the Holocaust. It kept her hands and her mind busy so that she would not remember what she couldn't forget. She supported our family of four, piano lessons, Hebrew school, college. She saved every penny she made, giving more to her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren than she ever kept for herself. This was her greatest pleasure in life. She never stopped dreaming. She wanted to live to see me get married and have children. She dreamt about lighting the candles at my children's bar and bat mitzvahs and attending their high school and college graduations. 15 years ago, she watched my daughter, Jennifer, stand under the wedding chuppah, the canopy, to marry Matthew. The dream continued when precious Talia, Perla, Jonah, and Elijah came into our lives the fourth generation after the Holocaust, making me a grandmother and my mother a great grandmother. She lived to see me become what I always yearned for, a bubby, pouring all the Yiddish kite I learned from her into my grandchildren, teaching them to love the Jewish traditions that were almost extinguished. These were moments my mother could never have imagined during the darkest years of her life. She lived to see our family tree grow, new branches added. She survived to delight in her children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren and to buy things that are blue, her favorite color, probably because the sky was the only color she saw for years while in Auschwitz. I could always see signs of where she had been in her eyes when we would eat in restaurants and a basket full of warm bread was brought to our table. I could see it in the way she would hold a cup of tea, her hands cradled around the cup for warmth. Subtle hints of where she had been, what she had survived. But at the end, she had everything she always wanted and she was free. Please remember her, the best thing in life is to be remembered. Thank you. I welcome all of your questions and please feel comfortable asking me anything. Thank you so much, Doris. Um, we're gonna give everybody a second to submit their questions. One that we do tend to get is, um, how did you get involved with the museum? Thank you. So as a 2G, a second generation, I've always had a deep commitment towards education, remembrance and advocacy. My mother used her voice to tell the world about the Holocaust and she taught me to use mine. So when I heard that the museum was going to open, I knew that there would be unlimited and meaningful opportunities for me. So I applied to become a docent. Um, that was 11 years ago. Uh, six years ago in 2014, I trained to become a part of the museum's uh, speakers bureau. 
Second Generation Bureau. Okay, um, we do have a question that just came in. Um, was it difficult to kind of to hear these stories and share them with your family and why is it so important for you to do so? Thank you, that's a great question. Yes, it was very difficult to hear these stories. Um, I've often been asked, when did my parents start to tell me these stories? And I always say, I can't remember a time when they didn't. Um, I grew up with so many lessons. Um, my mother always wanted to instill in me the gratitude for being born in a free country. She always told me that freedom is not free. Um, I grew up with the presence of absence, so many empty seats at our table, so many missing. Was it hard for me to tell my own children? It's part of my legacy. Children of Holocaust survivors are born with a responsibility. So I have shared this with my children. And as my grandchildren are now growing up, I'm sharing it with them as well. Brilliant. Um, another question we've just gotten is, um, Courtney says, how many friends, I have many friends who are hesitant to ask questions of Holocaust survivors for fear of offending or bringing up bad memories. So how would you encourage or suggest people to ask appropriate questions? Thank you. That's, that's a great question. Um, I would always deal with the subject and the survivor with a great deal of sensitivity. And I would always ask permission. I would ask if they're comfortable being asked questions and sharing their experiences. And if you see that some of the questions cause pain or sadness, then take your cues from the survivor. I, I think that as they have gotten older, they're all very motivated to find someone to listen to their stories. And it's so important to ask. Thank you, that is a wonderful answer and way to kind of approach that. Um, what, when you do field trips, you, uh, what kind of message do you want students to take from this? What should they be learning from the story? Can I give you a few of Absolutely. my goals? Okay, so I hope when our visitors leave that they take with them what they learned about the astonishing and inspiring strength of the human spirit that what they learned about hope and courage and resilience will remain with them should they ever need to face their own challenges. I hope that they'll remember the personal stories that we shared. I help them explore and discover all the artifacts in our museum. The artifacts are silent witnesses. They all have stories to tell and we give them a voice. I hope that they'll take these stories with them, that they will transmit them and maintain the memories. And of course, I want all our visitors to leave inspired and to take action, to really believe that everyone can and should make a difference. Those are amazing, um, that's great. Um, what is one part of the museum that you think is very important for everyone to see? Wonderful question. I'm so grateful that the museum just in the last year added the galleries on resistance because I focus every single tour on resistance. As the most commonly asked question I get is why didn't the Jewish people fight back? So I'm very proud to present the galleries that show the resistance that took place, the spiritual resistance, the armed resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto, the resistance in Auschwitz-Birkenau. One of the heroines of that resistance 
was Rosa Robata. My mother grew up with Rosa Robata and they were both in that same Zionist group I mentioned. As I said, they learned bravery and leadership skills. Sadly, Rosa and the other girls who were the ones, and we tell this story, that smuggled the gunpowder to the Sander Commando that enabled them to blow up the crematorium. These girls were caught. Um, Rosa was tortured. She never spoke. She never gave up any of the names. And when the Nazis hanged her, she was 23 years old and her last words were have courage and be strong, which was the motto of the Zionist group. That's an amazing piece I did not know about. Um, that I think is all the questions I'm seeing right now. So thank you. I will let you sign off. Thank you. Thank you all for joining and for tuning in today. Join us here next Wednesday, July 29 at 10 a.m. to hear Holocaust survivor Rhody Glass share her story. Please keep an eye on Illinois Holocaust Museum's Facebook and other social media accounts where we will post a stream of content through the weeks ahead. Thank you all for your support during these extraordinary times. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.